Welcome to the next WTF, uh, What to Fix in Recruiting, um, hosted by Jem. I am Brandis, your, your host. I was looking at the chat and I see everyone was like, where is everyone? Are we starting? We are here. We're excited. Um, to the person in the chat that's posing as me, it's okay. Just don't say anything weird. Um, we'll be fine. Um, but I'm excited today about our session focused on employer brand and how you can outlast trends, how you can build um, a, a, an employer brand that resonates with candidates um, and how you can get folks involved um, within your internal teams to help you boost that brand. So um, I'm going to go ahead and bring our panelists on stage. Um, and we have Brian Adams from PH Creative. We have Liam Darmody from uh, Liam's uh, bandstand. And then we have uh, Brittany joining us uh, from Brett. She is the head of people operations. Um, I'll let them come on and introduce themselves. Um, hey, guys. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Um, Brian, so uh, let's start with you. Tell the people who you are. Sure. Uh, nice to be here, everybody. I'm Brian Adams. I'm not the Canadian rock star. Uh, I'm the CEO and founder of PH Creative and Happy Dance. So we're a specialist employer branding agency, uh, as well as uh, uh, a SaaS career website technology. Very cool. Um, not me will go away soon, I'm assuming. Uh, Brittany, uh, it's good to see you. Hi, good to see you. Uh, I'm Brittany. I lead recruiting operations and employer brand at Brex, uh, based in New Jersey, but have been working for Brex for about just over four years. Very cool. Thanks for being here. Liam. Hi, my name is Liam Darmody, and I am the founder of Liam's Brand Stand, which is a personal and employer branding strategy firm. Uh, that I started uh, this past year after spending about 20 years in uh, recruiting and go-to-market operations at various uh, technical organizations. Awesome. So if this is your first WTF session, a couple of housekeeping things. I do love for you to ask questions as we're talking. Um, I'll stop the panelists and make sure we're addressing things in real time. Um, and also, we, we idea share here. So if, if you hear something and something's working at your organization or you have a strategy or a challenge, Go ahead and share that. Um, there's always a lot of chatter in the chat that I love to see, um, but make sure you submit those questions. Um, look at that, Liam, you're getting a shout out. Sarah Otsuki says, what's up, Liam? Um, <laughs> Hi, Sarah. <laughs> all right, so let's let's get started. Um, Brittany, I'm gonna start with you. So if you were attending a session like this and you read the, the, the session description before you registered and you were like, this one's for me, what would you wanna walk away with? I have attended sessions like these really at the start of my employer brand career. So I think what I'm always looking for is like tangible or actionable, like a playbook, essentially. What can I walk away with? What can I start doing today? What can I start working towards? I think there's so much you can do in employer brand and talent brand. So I think just some like really strong action items. Nice. Liam, what about you? Um, I think for me, understanding how to get employees amped about leveraging personal brands to amplify the employer brand would be something I'd want to know. And and really how to balance encouraging them to be themselves versus being overly prescriptive, because I think that's something that a lot of companies struggle with. Yeah, I agree with that. What about you, Brian? I think it's just about tangible takeaways that you can implement into the into your organization straight away, regardless of your current situation so hopefully things that you can take into the organization adds adds value that's what i always look for in a, a conversation like this so if you've heard the panelists correctly what they've promised you is they're going to solve all of your problems <laughs> in the next ish minutes and they're going to tell you exactly how to do it yes sound good all right <laughs> um so in talking about employer brand and candidate experience um brian i'll ask you this question um, what organizations are you seeing right now that's like just killing it right now? They're, they're setting a really high bar um, and they're, they're someone who should be kind of setting a blueprint for the rest of us. So I'm really excited um, about what we're doing with Nike at the moment. I think that's definitely um, a brand launch that's about to, about to burst onto the scene. Um, Intuitive Surgical are doing some amazing things around... Um, being really true to what they what they stand for, and also doing a great job of integrating the DEI into the employer brand. 
Um, beyond those two examples, I'm a big admirer of um, HubSpot, Netflix, and McKinsey for, for a variety of different reasons. But I think it's fair to say that they're all very clear with who they are and how strategically they go to marketplace. They're, they're always really aligned and buttoned up with their messaging. I love that. I love that. Um, Brittany, anyone you're seeing right now is, that you think is just like really killing it? I Netflix is definitely on my list. I think they've been really consistent over the past few years with everything going on. They've remained really true to their brand. I've also always been a really big fan of what Shopify does with their employer brand. I think they tell a really good story that really highlights their employees. So I tend to keep an eye on what they're they're up to. Yeah. What about you, Liam? Um, certainly Shopify. They were one that I went to school on when I was doing employer branding at my last company. Uh, love their campaigns. I think Apollo.io, the SaaS company, is just crushing the employer branding game, especially when it comes to presence on LinkedIn specifically. Um, they're everywhere. And uh, I think they sort of treat employer brand like a community and they're very vocal about it and they get everybody engaged. And uh, I think they're probably one of the best examples of, of at least how to leverage it on the LinkedIn platform for sure. Love that. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So if you're, you know, just starting out or looking for a refresh, maybe, you know, head over, check out their career site, check out their, you know, their pages and, and see what they're up to. Um, all right. So let's start off with, with talking about candidates first. Um, I've been hearing nonstop about, you know, as the market has shifted, you know, some brands are, are are treating candidates very well. Some brands are overwhelmed and they can't seem to um, maintain a good candidate experience. And I'm not saying this is like every situation, but, um, you know, candidates seem to be uh, lacking in terms of how organizations are communicating their brand and effectively doing it to attract talent. So, um with the current trend of companies deprioritizing candidate experience, and I'm not saying everyone is doing this again, but some people are, so we're going to call them out um, because right now we're in an employer's market. So what strategies would you recommend to maintain or even enhance the candidate journey to ensure the employer brand remains strong and attractive? Brian, I'll go to you first. Yes, yeah, so I would really recommend um, doing a, an exercise of mapping and designing the candidate experience that you have and when we go through that exercise we we use a, a couple of um sort of benchmarking aspects we always look at how a candidate is feeling at each touch point what they think um what's the memorable moment what tech and tools are, are in play and, and who owns that 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 branded moment and when you walk through exactly what your candidate experience is right now the reality of it and step back and say, okay, how do we want people to feel? What do we want them to think? What do we want them to remember? Um, you can start to make key decisions based on your limited budget, your limited time in terms of how do we get on brand and really deliver the main themes of what we stand for um, with, with impact. Just that exercise we find makes an incredible, an incredible difference from the get-go. Well, let me ask you this. How how do you know how candidates are feeling? And like, what are you doing to capture that information? And, and anyone can chime in on this. I'll I let somebody else. That yeah, I think that's what we're doing right now. We're we're actually going through this exercise where we're pulling, I mean, we're, we're always reading Glassdoor. And I think a lot of people have opinions about whether or not Glassdoor is valid. And a lot of people think maybe there's disgruntled employees or former employees. I mean, there is a lot of truth in Glassdoor too. So we're always keeping a, a pulse there. We're keeping a pulse on internal culture surveys. And then we're looking at blind and then really just trying to pull a lot of, um, a lot of feedback from candidates to hear what they're saying. I think what is really important, what we see from candidates is don't overpromise. Don't say you're going to give feedback if you don't have time to give feedback that immediately jeopardizes the candidate experience. Like some of this is really back to the basics, communicate well and don't overpromise things to people because that just leaves them a salty taste in their mouth years later when they might consider you as a brand again. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's, you know, I mean, let's be real with everything that's happened over the last six months or more, you know, we're seeing more of those open to work, um, 
you know, signs on LinkedIn and, and people are, you know, upset and, and, and leaving reviews and it's happening to a lot of different companies. Right. And so like, there's a balance, um, of how we, you know, view that information and how we action on it and kind of what that, what that looks like. I think in, in most organizations, there's usually quite a lot of very recent new hires that are literally fresh out of the candidate experience that can give you some real good insight into what felt good, what could be improved, you know, what did they go and tell their friends about and what made the biggest difference, you know, so as part of the onboarding experience, gathering that feedback while it's fresh is, is definitely something I'd recommend. Yeah, I think that's that's massive. I think a lot of companies don't necessarily treat the candidate experience like a customer experience or a client experience. And I think that's, that's short-sighted um, because you never know when somebody, I mean, if somebody has a bad experience with you, that's a negative thing they're going to talk about anytime they talk about your brand. Uh, and you don't want that. I mean, you wouldn't want your clients doing it. You wouldn't want your customers doing it. So I think treating the candidate experience through a marketing lens is really, really important, which means you're surveying people. You're asking the questions. You want to know where you're falling down. You want to know where you're doing really well. Um, you know, trying to make it so that every touch point is, is an opportunity for surprise and delight. I mean, the last company that I worked at, we had alumni that moved on to other companies that were part of singing our praises in our recruitment marketing materials because they liked it so much. And so we thought that was, you know, really special. And we use that as an example. Um, but I think you, you have to look at it through a marketing and, and customer satisfaction lens. Now, do we truly think that, you know, an organization, whether you have an employer brand team or not, that someone's sitting there and they're saying like, screw the candidates. <laughs> like, let's just, <laughs> let's just do whatever we're going to do. And like, we'll see what lands and like, you know, we'll just, <laughs> kind of like just ride off of vibes or whatever. So, and, and I'm, I'm saying this to say, like, I don't think people are, are consciously doing that. So if, if this is an issue, like, where do we think things are taking away from the ability to focus on these things or to solve some of these issues? Bandwidth. I think it's an operational problem. Um, you know, you've only got so many recruiters, you've only got so many people that can cover so much ground. And especially now, you see jobs posted, you know, seven hours ago, they have a thousand applicants. Uh, you know, a recruiter is a human being. They can't go through everything. And and the recruiter, right, has their, their focus on, let me find the 10 candidates that look best. And if those 10 candidates are in the pile of 100, then the other 900 might not even get looked at, right? And it's just, it's a bandwidth thing. Then they got to move on to the next rec, right? And so I think that's one of the bigger challenges. It's It's not intentional. It's just, it's a matter of bandwidth. It's interesting you say that, Liam, because I think one of the biggest fundamental flaws we see with employer branding is setting out to just become more attractive because ultimately what then happens is you get more applications and yep. then candidate experience suffers because you can't handle it. And I think if we think about employer brand as, a, as more of a smart filter designed to repel more people than it compels, yes. then we can start to offer a very intentional candidate experience, which aligns with our brand. And we've, we've found a lot of success with that, that approach. Okay. So at the beginning of this, we said that we were going to solve everyone's problems. So the three of you, how are you, how are you automating this? How are you taking some of the load um, off of folks who just don't have, have the bandwidth? I mean, I think on, on my end, I can speak to, we try to make things as easy as possible and I think in recruiting operations and player brand, you can definitely tend to like become a yes man, which I try not to do. I don't want to, I don't want to accept every single task that could possibly be given to us. But what we'll do, for example, job descriptions came up when Brian was just talking about, you know, employer brands should almost like help filter out people. Well, we spent a lot of time thinking about job descriptions, training our hiring managers on how to write job descriptions, having people who are actually sitting in those jobs review the job descriptions and say, is this accurate for an accurate reflection of what you actually do? So I think there are, I tend to go back to the basics, but there are a lot of things that you can do that just really simplify making sure that people aren't going to apply. And I think the other thing is we actually don't post on every single job platform. At one point we did. And I think there's a common misconception that employer brand is tied with application volume. That's not necessarily the metric that you should always be looking at. And a lot of our recruiters have asked us to 
kind of help us tone down the amount of applications they're receiving because to Brian's point, like you get such high volume, you can't actually reply to all of these. So now you're almost jeopardizing the candidate experience again, where it's like, we'd rather be able to review every single resume that's coming through and decide whether or not we can move forward with them. So I think limiting where you're actually posting and limiting um, and really focusing on that job description is, is a really good starting point. No, after you. Um, appreciate that. I was just going to say, I mean, it, it can also be a massive opportunity to differentiate in the marketplace if you're the company that says, here's the five top reasons people typically join. Here's the five top reasons people typically stay. Um, and here's the five top reasons that people aren't a good match for us. And being very clear with that and encouraging people to make smarter decisions, it's actually really refreshing. And not a lot of brands have the confidence to do that. So it can stand out and get a lot of attention for the right reasons. I love that so much. I think that a lot of brands are nervous to admit what might be considered a flaw or a negative experience, but your truth is your truth, right? Be authentic. Like if you're in an environment that has a really like high intensity culture and you expect people to work long hours, like own it, right? And let people see that that is what the experience they're going to have is. Because the worst thing that can happen is you get somebody in through the funnel, you put them through the offer process, they join. And then two months later, they're like, wait a minute, this didn't align with what I was expecting when I was coming in here. And then they're gone. You're out of an employee and you got to hire somebody else. Like just be authentic about what you are as a business, understand your culture through the lens of your employees and market the hell out of that. Like that is how you attract the talent that wants to be in that environment. You're hundred percent right. What you tend to find is existing employees then feel more seen and heard and they will become advocates because it's okay to talk about the harsh realities and adversities. It's also the quickest way to collect a load of stories that, have passion and pride in them because when you talk about a challenge, you talk about overcoming a challenge. Um, that's usually a really interesting story. And that you, that's how we find you get to the real good stuff that candidates care about and appreciate. I'm going to, I'm going to drill you guys on, on, cause we're getting into like, kind of like the, the longevity authenticity kind of part of the conversation. And um, I have I have some questions around this for sure, but let me just back up for for the audience right now. So, David um, David asked for for Brian, can you speak more about the repel versus compel? Yeah, so um, I've I've actually written a book on this called Give and Get Employer Branding, which um, outlines the entire philosophy, and and that's essentially what we believe. Liam said it very eloquently there. If you own your truth and lean into the harsh realities and adversities, there's a number of ways that can be received. People will see it as a challenge that they don't wish to take on. Some will take it as a challenge that they want to rise to and they will find some real personal worth and value. Um, others, the challenge won't be big enough. And ultimately, you're trying to create a communication system that really distinguishes how people will find a sense of purpose, impact, and belonging. They're the sort of three macro metrics. Um, and if you're really clear on your strengths, benefits, and opportunities, as well as the harsh realities and adversities, you can create a give and a get for every sort of employer brand pillar, which makes it really easy to be authentic and transparent um, and compelling at the same time. Does that answer your question? Does that help? Um, that answered David's question for sure. Uh, <laughs> thanks, David. Um, one other question came in, um, and you know, Liam, you might be the best one to answer this. Um, what content is a must on LinkedIn pages? This is specifically someone from the biotech and bioengineering industry. I mean, I think that the more content that you can put out on the platform that features the people who make your company operate, the better. Uh, I think people relate to people. Uh, people are, when they're looking at potentially applying to jobs, they're looking at the people that work there. They're looking at their profiles. So like show a lot of that information up front. Um, have a really good about section, have a really good job section, have a really good life at section. 
um, give people a window into what it's like to work at your company, like a real window. And they'll want to walk through it, right? They'll want to they'll want to knock on the door and come in. And and I think you know, to Brian's point, if you're doing that in a way that's authentic and and speaks to the actual culture that's there, there might be people that don't want it. They might look in and they're just window shopping and they're like, yeah, gonna go to the next one. And that's great because it saves you the time of having to to you know screen that candidate and put them through the the, the motions. Like they're doing you a favor by moving on. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Brittany, tell me a little bit, um, I, I love this question from, from Haley. Have you seen talent communities, um, and talent newsletters work to like, to nurture candidates? We're still talking about the candidate centric part of all this. Right. I, I can't really speak to newsletters. We've, we've thought about doing it a few times and, and really it just comes down to not having the bandwidth. We have also thought about partnering with, um, our communities and, this actually came up last year and then we paused and it came up again this year as something we might do. But um, I think a good way that you can work with your communities is really thinking about them as a, they could be your brand ambassadors. So really helping to push content out and share, um, share content, even just giving feedback on your employer brand. I've gone to our communities and pulled them together for um, like a focus group and said, how does this feel? Does this feel authentic to who Brex is? Um, but also doing referral events with them, which can really help with, I think a DEI angle is definitely there where you can try to drive different referrals. I think there's a lot of, a lot of people have pushback on referral programs can tend to drive the same type of employees that already work at the company. So by partnering with different employee resource groups, you can try to drive employees that are, are similar to those employee resource groups. So that's the way we've thought about using communities. We haven't tested it yet. Um, mainly for budget purposes, but we've thought about other ways of just doing this virtually and thinking about doing round tables or fireside chats that we could do with them as well. Gotcha. Thanks for that, Brittany. All right. We're going to, we're going to move on to, um, to talking more about strategies for long, for long longevity. And Brittany, since you, you mentioned kind of um, partnering with other parts of the organization, um, I'll start with you. So as the talent market continues to shift, how can brands remain agile without seeming opportunistic or inauthentic? Um, I think it's really important when it's really important to know when to pivot and really thinking about your company and aligning your employer brand to the business objective. So I can use Brex as an example where I have started and stopped writing an EVP three times in the four years that I've worked here. And a lot of people have probably heard that before you build an EVP, which is essentially just your content strategy. But by the time it gets to LT, the business direction's changing. The culture or our values might be getting a retweak. We're adding leadership principles. So there's a number of things. So there has to be a right time to actually move forward with something like this. Um, but even more down to the tactical level, for the last four years, we've responded to every single glass door review. And right now we just went through a riff. We had 300 people laid off recently. Now is not the time for us to be apologizing and, and responding. It's time for us to pause and let people vent and get their feelings out. And I think it's really important to not try and cover up the fact that people are angry right now, that there was just a riff. So sometimes I think it's really important that we are accurately reflecting what's happening internally. And what you'll see is that there's still a lot of positive that's coming through as well. But sometimes you just have to pause and let people kind of speak their minds there as well. Brian, as you're coaching um, organizations on this, um, how do you help them remain, keep their authenticity? <laughs> yeah, so what we find is 99.9% .9 of success leaning into this particular challenge comes down to alignment with the, the business strategy and understanding who you are as an organization. And actually, that's also the secret to get the buy-in from the CEO and um, uh, and championing from from a from a sort of sweet C suite perspective, and what we find is an employer brand really offers you a north star of consistency and things that won't change through times of evolution, transition, and volatility. And those those anchor points really foster confidence and loyalty through times of change from a, an employee base 
you know, so we really look for those those aspects. And you know, I guess authenticity is a big a big word at the moment, but authentically knowing what to engage with and what not to is really important. And it it needs to really align with the organization and what you historically have said you stand for. For example, it's no surprise whatsoever that Nike leans into Black Lives Matter and they're vocal in that conversation because it aligns with who they are as an organization and kind of always has. If Chick-fil-A suddenly pop up and get involved in that conversation, it would be quite surprising and opportunistic and not on brand. So we find that the key is, is alignment and being very clear on the conversations that are appropriate for a brand to get involved in and also what's appropriate to, to stay away from. Brian, I, <laughs> I'm laughing because I was actually gonna bring that up as an example, Chick-fil-A specifically, but I was mm -hmm. gonna say like, you know, if everyone's like, oh, we, we only sell hamburgers now and they're like, yeah, we love, you know, beef. Like, come on guys. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, Liam, I'm not gonna put you on the spot, but if, if you have anything to add, um, would, would, would love to hear your perspective. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that what both Brian and Brittany said is just a, a, an emphasis on, on the humanity behind it. Right. I think like, what's interesting is that, you know, human resources has always been like my first role in human resources was, I was asked if I wanted to do it. And I was like, that means taking care of the employees. Right. And our general counsel was like, yeah, sort of. And then I had to lay off 300 people. Like it was a very, like, non inhumane process right and so i think putting the human at the center of everything and thinking about like from britney's perspective like people are pissed that we had a layoff like they're going to be upset it's their right to be upset and we as an organization who cares about human beings are okay with them being upset because yeah we realize it sucks it wasn't fun for anybody right and and you know you don't have to try and like sugarcoat something that just by all definitions sucks <laughs> uh it, it's actually more refreshing if you don't and you just show that human side of it um and i think that that's very important and then to what brian was saying like focusing on where you should be having the conversation and where you're not having the conversation um is 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 essential i think you put people at the center of your employer brand and your recruitment marketing campaigns and you really it's hard to do wrong if you if you take that approach authentically and like genuinely yeah. So if, I mean, if you want to, let's get tactical for a second. If you want to be a brand that lasts, right? Like I, I hear someone say, put people at the center of it, be a human, try to connect with people, tell a story that has passion. And I'm like, that sounds great. Like I would love to do that. And whether I'm a business that's in hyper growth mode or scaling up, or I'm one that has to scale back, where do people start? How, how, how can they start to tackle some of these things? How, how have you done it in the past? I can start. Um, what we did, and this kind of also like coattails off your last question. I think something that has like remained really authentic in the four years I've been with Brex is our values. We lean on them. We communicate with them internally, externally. Like it is really, it's embedded in our interview process. And when we first started thinking about employer brands, we thought about what is our focus right now? Who are we hiring? And at the time we were focusing on leadership hiring, we were focused on tech hiring and then we were focused on new markets. So Canadian hire, we were opening up in Canada and then I believe we started hiring Brazil at the time. So we built candidate personas for these three groups and really looked at, in, at internal employees and sent out surveys and did interviews with about 20 in each group and really asked the same questions to these 20 different people across levels, across, well, across levels for EPD, but for if it was location-based, it would be across functions to really get a good understanding of this employee group. And then we built candidate personas and there was a bit more research that went into it, but every decision we made about employer brand, we would go back to that and really try to understand, does this align with what we expect and how we should be targeting these, this type of candidate. So we just found it really helpful. And years later, what we found true was that the values stayed the same. The type of people we were hiring stayed the same because values were so deeply embedded in our process as well. So we were still, maintaining a good culture, which ultimately impacted our brand too, because, you know, it all starts from within. Yeah. I love that. Liam, what about you? I love the, I love that you touched on the persona at the team level. Um, I think one of the things that was most unique about the last company that I was at Willow tree was that 
uh, they very much empowered each of the organizations to kind of take an ownership of like, what is the culture of your team? So they had micro sites for the teams and, you know, like you could really get a sense for what the teams were like based on what those micro sites were and marketing was involved in the conversation. Right. So, you know, our employer brand actually lived within marketing, not within human resources and recruiting. Um, and I think that that alignment is interesting because marketers are always thinking about the persona. They're always thinking about customer satisfaction and they're always thinking about conversion. Right. And so it's a very interesting thing when you blend those two strategies together. Um, but I mean, we had people that were identified on every single team, like culture champions that were folks that could like really kind of speak up on behalf of their team for what's going well, what's not going well, what's the ideal candidate look like, who struggles, who's strong. Like, and, and again, it comes back to, having open conversations and dialogue about what's really happening within the walls of your organization. And I think a lot of companies are still uncomfortable to have those conversations. Brian, how do you have those conversations? How do you, how do you coach people to have those conversations? <laughs> <laughs> um, so we look at it slightly more strategically at the macro level to begin with. And, um, so we reverse engineer from the reputation you need as an employer in order to in order to win. Um, and typically, we found there's three types of reputation. There's career catalyst, you're known as a place to accelerate your career. There's culture, you're known for an empathetic, compassionate place to be and belong. And then there's citizenship, where an organization that sets out to leave the world better than we found it. Once you have clarity on what type of organization you are, you can then build content around it and, and galvanize and prove out you deserve that reputation. For example, if you're a career catalyst organization, you might build a content series of every employee after they've just been promoted. So you're proving that people are constantly moving up in their career and they're giving advice on what it takes to thrive in their role, what they learned, how they grew, how it felt. Um, so everything is pointing towards the reputation you're trying to create at the macro level. So that, that's how we typically approach it. And the tactics can then fall out of that, that strategy. I love that. Prove the representation. I'm sorry. Prove, <laughs> prove the <laughs> reputation you want to have. Yeah. Like prove, prove that like not only is that like we're not just talking about it, but we're actually going to, to walk the walk. Um, and and be that and be that for the long haul and and have a solid foundation and not, you know, um, start selling hamburgers at Chick Fil A. Um, so, if you guys could put um, could button up this section, we're talking about longevity. Um, as we know, we're trying to keep this through the lens of like things are just constantly changing, right? So folks are just like trying to catch their breath, and then something new happens, and then. But what I hear you saying is even even though those things are true and you're going to have the winds blowing and, you know, the storm is raging and whatnot, Brittany, to your point, if your values are strong, you're going to be able to look to that when you need to pivot and when you need to make decisions. And Ryan, if you if you know who you want to be and you're going to prove that, that that's what you're going to do, then that should also give you a pretty solid foundation. Um, Liam, what would you add to that to, to, to button this up, to kind of wrap this section up in a book? I mean, I think you have to be self-aware and I think you have to be willing to have conversations that might otherwise have been uncomfortable for you and make sure that you're aligning yourself with the experiences of the people that are at your organization. Um, I think a lot of times there's a disconnect between senior management and senior leadership um, and the people that are actually running, you know, the, the teams and the people that are doing the work. And so um, that's important. I think the other thing is acknowledge that employer brand is a valuable thing for your business and invest in it as if you would investing in marketing in any other capacity for clients or sales. Um, there are people like Brian who have worked with massive corporations and have seen a whole lot of different things through his lens. You can get a lot of experience and understanding of what it's like to be an effective, uh, you know, strategist in the employer brand realm. It, that's hard for founders that have been building their company for the last 10 years, right? They don't have a subjective point of view or an, an objective point of view, and they can't bring a whole lot to the table with diverse mindsets. But you hire somebody that has experience doing that and they can guide you. And I think that needs to be something people do more in the next decade, uh, at least and beyond. You, you said it, Liam. Actually, we can all just go now. I'm just going to grab a cup of tea. 
<laughs> I'm very passionate about it. There you go, my Ryan. <laughs> So, I mean, we've been kind of talking about this, but um, it's a bullet on the description, so we have to talk about it again. Um, and sometimes you just drive, you just drill things in and people get it, right? We'll just say it in, we'll say it in a different way. So let's talk about unconventional stakeholders. Brittany, you mentioned ERGs. Um, Liam, you're talking now about just having conversations internally. Um, what do you, what would you say, Brian is, is or sorry, Brittany, is like the, the most often overlooked group within an organization that could, and I'm, I use this term very loosely, revolutionize employer branding if they had a bigger voice? Um, and and why might their contribution actually not have a voice or be unexpected? I kind of mentioned this earlier, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with this one again, but I think new hires. I think on one hand, they might be shy to say something because it's their first week in an organization, but they are coming fresh off your interview process. They probably have a lot of feedback or thoughts about how things have gone. Um, They've considered, they know what else is on the market too. Like they know, they can tell you about your competition and what else they've heard. So we really try to lean on the new hires and we send a culture survey about a week after they have been fully onboarded and say, A, tell us how we did. And then we also encourage them to write on Glassdoor to help other candidates understand what our interview process is like um, as an interviewer. So honestly, I think new hires have like a ton of value and probably don't get asked a ton about our employer brand. Even if like, how did you hear about us? Where did you first hear about us? I think the source of hire and how you heard about us are two completely different questions. So really understanding those two questions is is important. This might not be like a, like a moment for anyone else, but I was just thinking back to roles that I've had, especially when there are multiple roles, like say you need to hire like six engineers or whatever it is, and one gets hired. But no one's ever asked me, well, what what made you say yes? What made you choose us? And then I can take that information and I can go take that back to the market, right? right. Like personally, no one's, only one company has asked me that question. I, I happen to work here now. Thank you, Jen. But, <laughs> but no one's asked me that question. And it's such valuable information, right? They've gone through this terrible, horrible hiring process. No matter how good or great it is, it's all terrible. No one wants to like sit through interviews. And then yeah, you just kind of let that information go to waste. That's, that's that's unfortunate. I think marketing and sales are two organizations that, if you're if you're really focused on building an employer brand that resonates with the market, you've got teams internally that spend their entire days, month over month, year over year, trying to convince people to pay attention to your organization. And they're used to thinking about that stuff. And so I think having those folks in the conversation, like, when I was in my last employer branding role, I was on marketing, but you know, a lot of the folks in the talent team weren't super happy that they had to deal with me all that much. You know, it was like, he's over there in marketing, like just adding stuff to the funnel and sending out all this stuff. Like he's not in the trenches with us. And I think you have to avoid having that kind of adversarial relationship because at the end of the day, you're all trying to do the same thing. And that's recruit fantastic talent that belongs here and adds to the culture. Um, and, and if you've got people that know how to do that for a living, it's important to in include them in that discussion. I love that. Um, Brian, we've got about 10 minutes left, so I'm expecting a mic drop moment from you here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't, I don't know about that, but, um, I've, I've been doing, I've been doing this for 20 years next month and I've worked with hundreds of companies and in every single one of them. The weakest link has been, drum roll, the hiring managers, mm. because they're busy, they're disenfranchised, they sometimes are too important to embrace the employer brand, et cetera, et cetera. So what we do is we empathy map the hiring manager experience and the recruiter experience, and we prove to them we've designed an activation for their benefit and convenience as well. And we set out to make them the biggest champions of employer brand because when it comes to face-to-face, -to -face, um, bringing it to life, the hiring manager and the recruiters have the opportunity to make the biggest impact positively or, or negatively. And so if you, if you get hiring managers on board and they, they see that you've done something for their convenience, not just an idealistic candidate experience, it can make an incredible difference to the whole deal. Um, and then, you know, I think what Brittany said is not to be underestimated. Um, you know, and actually 
Liam doubled down on it as well. Every successful new hire is evidence your employer brand worked, which should be celebrated and harnessed. Um, you know, and the, the last thing I'll say about that is quite often the reason you join is not the reason you stay. And it's really interesting to circle back three, six months, nine months, 12 months to get the difference between why you said, yes, I'll join and why you're continuing to turn up every day. That's gold dust for the evolution of your employer brand. I love that. Um, we have um, a question. Um, <clears throat> and while, while we answer this question, I'm going to pop up a, a quick little survey poll thing that uh, we'll see if we can get it to work because it just helps me better have these conversations and follow up with you guys. But um, building employer brand from scratch, this is from Tim. When marketing is focused on on products and partnerships, how can a talent acquisition team find the connections to the wider company brand to allow them to see the value of employer branding? Big question. <laughs> so Harvard Business Review just released a study that boiled down all business strategy down to two things, which is employee and supplier happiness and customer happiness and the owners of each are is brand um and so you, proving a business case of employer brand usually lies in um finding the people derivative problems and challenges and opportunities of existing business strategy and existing um, priorities of of your leadership so I would start there and build a business case to demonstrate how you can impact the existing priorities of the business. Liam, Brittany, anything, uh, anything to add to that? I think my first year at Brex, I had the argument with our, with a few people on our brand team about whether or not our employer brand voice should be the same as our, product voice. And I think that was something that took us a long time to convince them that while our employer brand and our product brand should definitely have similarities and they should look and feel the same, we're speaking to two completely different customers. And I feel like once we won, won that battle, um, there was a lot more alignment. And I think there's also a lot of education that goes into employer brand. You have to explain to the organization Yes, market, most marketing teams are always understaffed. They are always slammed. By having a better employer brand, we could hire better people for you that makes you less, that gives you back more bandwidth. So I think there's a ton of education in there um, with your partners, with your leadership team that can really go a long way just by explaining why this is so valuable. Yeah, and I will say Jenna dropped in a comment that said, you know, um, working with their head of content um, was actually something that was really helpful um, to kind of help improve the employer brand. And I'll say at GEM, um, our, our head of people have has come to me as the head of content and said, hey, you know, we want to spruce things like things up. We, we need to, to, to do a kind of an overhaul. Um, and I'm a wonderful person. So I said, yes, but um, if you, <laughs> I'm kidding, but if you have folks on your team that you want to bring into the fold, you know, and, and, and sell them on what Brittany just said, like, it's, you know, what is it? More water raises all the boats. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, all right. We're reaching the end guys. Um, what, uh, what other questions do we have for the panel? And Brian, someone asked if, if you have a link to that, to that, um, that article you mentioned, um, they would I greatly appreciate it just looking for it it's actually a podcast episode um if you search for hbr on strategy it's a brilliant podcast uh and i'll continue to try and find the exact episode and share it if i can while you're looking Sweet. for questions i actually have a question for brian uh is that okay <laughs> sure uh so brian one of the things that i noticed when i started paying attention to the employer branding space is that a lot of the conversation like in the podcast arena tends to be in europe um, a, a lot of UK, a lot of Spain, a lot of Germany is, is it more popular in Europe and overseas for your employer brand to be a really significant part of a company and not so much in the U S have you found? 
Uh, it's interesting, actually. I mean, I, I, I spend half the month in the UK and half the month in, in the US, technically a little bit more in the US. That's where my wife and mortgage and dog is. So, but it, it's, <laughs> it, I would say it's, it's, it's fairly evenly spread, certainly okay. with corporates and sort of enterprise size organizations. What I would say is the US market is, tends to be a little bit more tech um, and HR tech focused using technology and tools to solve, whereas UK and Europe do tend to be a little bit more strategic and comms focused. Mm, there, there is a, a subtle difference there. Um, but I wouldn't like to say which market was more sophisticated or, or, you know, I think it's about even. Got it. Thank you. This question has been upvoted. Do either three of you know of any organizations other than 200, uh, less than 200 employees that are doing employer brand well? Ooh, um, there's, there's a life sciences company called Sage Therapeutics that we, we worked with a number of years ago, but, um, they did some, we did some fantastic work and, and they carried it on fantastically. Um, and they really lived it uh, and breathed it authentically. So I, I would check out um, Sage Therapeutics. They're based in, um, in Boston. A very, very smart chief people officer. Really awesome. interesting. Um, and because I am a woman of the people, um, I ask all questions. So, um, and we could do a whole other, <laughs> we could do a whole other webinar on this, I think. But do either three of you have any advice for, for government organizations in terms of employer brand? Could be something you've seen work. It could also be something you would just like to see them do. Uh, I think, I think <laughs> Crickets. <laughs> I tried. I tried. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you this, though. I think um, a lot can be learned from the military messaging. I think mm. the military, like the Marines, 99.9% need not apply. I mean, there's a give and get proposition designed to repel more, more people and it compels. Um, they tend to do it really well. Um, I think government organizations tend to be, um, they play it safe to the point where it's just vanilla, you know, and there's, there's a lot of value there if they were just a little bit more courageous. Awesome. All right. Last question. Um, uh, curious to hear, uh, this is from Kat. Um, oh, now I'm going to have to ask you two questions and then we'll go. Um, would you frame any of this differently when thinking about clinical hiring in this space? We want to drive more applications and build brand with within those clinical communities. Mm -hmm. I would say in in my very limited experience of that space, to be fair, being more real, more authentic, more gritty with what it really takes to thrive and or just survive is probably the, the best route and the most effective that, that I've seen. Um, granted, I haven't got a huge amount of experience in that space, to be fair, but where there is real resilience required, I think it's it's very important to lean into that. I think one thing I would add, and I don't have experience in that space, but I think this reminds me of candidate personas and trying to hire in new markets or for new roles, for example, try to figure out where those people are. What are they reading? Where are they? What groups are they a part of? And like, put insert yourself into those spaces, whether it's posting job boards or getting involved in that community and starting to like get your company's voice heard. I think that also goes a long way and just helps with brand recognition. Yeah, segmenting the audience and getting more insights is, is a, a great shout, absolutely. All right, Danielle, I said I was a woman of the people. I, I, I know some brands that do this very well, um, but let's see if the, the panelists also. So, um, you know, we have, there's a lot of talk during Pride Month about companies, um, you know, putting up their flag during the month of June. So do we know any companies in particular that show their support for the LGBTQ plus community in an authentic way versus it being um, opportunistic. Chick-fil-A, so, I'm kidding. <laughs> so do you know, this, this, is, this is less about my sort of professional life but, and my addiction to caffeine, but 
every time I walk into a Starbucks, which is roughly every time I see a Starbucks, <laughs> I always feel there is a sense of camaraderie, team spirit, and a togetherness. And quite often there's a little chalkboard somewhere with a written message or whatever. And it always lifts me how inclusive a Starbucks feels. Um, I, I would put that forward as a, as a good example. Yeah, and I, I would take that beyond um, beyond beyond Pride Month. I mean, you, you could look at Black History Month. You could look yep. at um, Indigenous Peoples Day. You could look at whatever these things are that we have um, in whatever country you live in um, and just say, if, if you're doing it 365 days of the year, then you're probably doing it well. If you're doing it for 30, if you're doing it for 30 days, um, then then maybe not so much. So I would just, you know, kind of going back to, um, you know, what, what are your core values, you know, and improving the reputation that you want to have um, and living that every every single day. Cool. Um, well, Brian, Brittany, Liam, thank you so much. I enjoyed this conversation. I know um, our audience did as well. Hopefully you enjoyed being here. Um, I and I email you again, you you won't archive it immediately. So um, I, I greatly appreciate you. Um, guys, uh, join us next month for um, a topic. I don't know what it's going to be yet. I'll figure it out. But, um, but we'll see you there. And uh, everyone have a good rest of your week. This was awesome. Thanks, Thanks so much for having Thanks me. So All right. Bye, Thanks, everyone. Man. Take care.